He was an incredible marksman, but he was also a great athlete. He was a great show-off, bless his heart. He used to bet people that he could walk two blocks on his hands and doing he- a handstand, and he won every time, I swear. Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to A Word on Westerns. We all know what good directors and good actors make wonderful teams. There's, of course, John Wayne and John Ford, Howard Hawks and John Wayne. How about Roy Rogers and William Whitney, a great actor-director team? And you know what we have today? We're in Lone Pine, where they shot a lot of these, where Roy shot his first movie. I've got the daughter of Roy Rogers, Cheryl Rogers Barnett, and William Whitney's son, J.D. Whitney. Welcome to this show. Thanks, Rob. So glad to see you both here. This is such a magical place, the Alabama Hills and Lone Pine. It is. Yeah, Dad became Roy Rogers in Under Western Stars. That was his first starring film, and it was, of course, made here. And it was his first time on Trigger, and he went into negotiations to buy him on a contract from the rental That stable. first film he wanted to buy him? Yeah. How long did that take him to make that deal happen? Years. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, the negotiations, I don't think, started or took that long, but his paying it off oh. took years. Yeah. Is that because Herbert Yates just didn't appreciate his talents monetarily? Well, Dad made $75 a week. Oh. So he didn't even have a stunt man on Under Western Stars because they weren't paying him anything, they weren't risking anything. So dad did almost all of his own stunts. But they did put out a call for one stunt and dad could never remember which one it was. But the call went out to the to all of Lone Pine and there were a couple of other studios, I guess, shooting up here at the same time. And of all people, it was a teenage Richard Farnsworth <laughs> who answered the call and who doubled dad. Really? And they were both making their first movies. Wow, that's fantastic. Dick was probably 19 years old at the time. I think, yeah, 18 or 19 yeah. was all, yeah. Wow, well, and they became lifelong friends. Yes. Uh, that's so yeah. terrific. Now, your dad, J.D., he was doing serials at that time when Roy made his film debut. Well, yes, yes, in 1938, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, he uh, directed the Lone Ranger, uh, the, the original Lone Ranger serial. Out here in Lone out, Pine. Out here in Lone Pine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, he fell in love with Lone Pine. As a matter of fact, we used to have a ranch not too far from here. And so I've been uh, here in Lone Pine a lot. After the war, your dad hooked up with Roy, and they made a series. That's of, correct. Of that's when that's when Dad came uh, into the Rogers uh, uh, spectrum, and of course, uh, the Rogers became a part of our uh, family. I mean, we, yeah. you know, it, back in those days, the uh, uh, the motion picture, especially at Republic, were family. Mm-hmm. And Cheryl and I have known each other a long time, so. Uh, uh, coming to Lone Pine is a, a kind of a reunion for us. Well, uh, yeah, it is for a lot of people who come here. I know that over the years, the Lone Pine Film Festival has brought people back who hadn't been here in years. I know uh, this year, Patrick Wayne is here. He hadn't been here since 1967 when he did An Eye for an Eye. But in those early days, you'll yeah. remember, Doug Fairbanks Jr. was here for the Gunga Den location. Ernie Borgnine and Ann Francis visited the location for uh, bad day at Black Rock. Yeah, it's such a an emotional feeling. Have you walked the area where your dad made his film debut? Uh, we made some of it, uh, but of course not all, because they did shoot in quite a lot of the area. But a dear friend, Mike Johnson, who is a Brit Canadian who used to come every year uh, to the festival. He was talking to Dad, and he asked Dad if Dad remembered where the dam was that they had used in Under Western Stars. And none of the local people knew where that dam was. Hmm. And so Dad immediately, and this is like, oh golly, maybe two or three years before Dad passed, but he told Mike, oh yeah, you just, you go out, 
the highway and you turn off to the right and it's such and such ranch I can't remember, but Dad did. And you drive up about a mile and a half and look to your left, and there's the dam. So Mike did it that next year during festival, and sure enough, <laughs> Dad had remembered after all of those years, remembered exactly where it was, and it was still there. Wow. Well, he sprung out like a, a total movie star with that first film. He had been around as, as Leonard Sly with the sons and appearing in different films, but in Under Western Stars, he yeah. became an instant star, and his sidekick in that film was Gene's sidekick, Smiley Burnett. Yeah. Because they took a Gene Autry script and gave it to Roy? Yes, they did. Uh, Gene had gotten into one of his disputes with Republic, which he was getting I more believe... Than Seventy-five dollars a week. Though, oh wasn't he? yes, he oh, was getting okay. a whole lot more than seventy-five dollars <laughs> a week. But uh, he'd been with Republic for a number of years mm -hmm. too, and Dad, you know, he he was one of the founders of the Sons of the Pioneers, and he got into Gene's movies with the Sons of the Pioneers, and ended up having speaking parts mm -hmm. in two of those films. The old corral, I know he had a line and a, and a right. fight with Gene. Yes, and that's when they signed him to the $75 a week contract. So when Gene went off, I mean, I guess they put the call out across Hollywood for somebody, you know, for the actors to come in and try out. And Dad didn't hear about it until he went to, to get a hat. And uh, this actor came in and said, oh, he had a screen test the next day. So Dad, who had worked on the lot, figured that he would sneak on since he didn't have a screen test. And of all the, I mean, he was so lucky. And he came in at lunch with Saul Siegel, who was producing mm -hmm. Gene's films, and Saul, of course, knew him, and that's how Dad snuck on. Saul got him on the lot, and he said, gee, we hadn't thought about you, and you're under contract. <laughs> so they tested Dad, and he got the part, and he went from Leonard Sly to Roy Rogers. And How did his name change? Who came up with that? It was sort of a committee decision, is my understanding. Um, they asked Dad what name he would like to use, and he and the Pioneers, just a few weeks before, had been in San Bernardino when Will Rogers was there that same weekend, and it's the weekend that Will Rogers was leaving for Alaska on no. that flight. And so Dad said that he didn't care about the first name, but he wanted Rogers as his last name because he had just been so impressed, like everybody. So um, they tossed out some names and Dad wrote them down with Rogers and he said Roy looked and sounded the best and... Wow, <laughs> magic. Uh, yeah, and thank heavens because one of the main songs in Under Western Stars is Vote for Rogers, Ring the Bell. Let prosperity begin, ring the bell and vote him in. Because he was running for his father's Senate seat or something. Wow. But, yeah. I mean, he always said it was better to be lucky than good. Thank God he was both. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, so often with his career, mm -hmm. things like that happened. Well, I know after the war, his image changed. and, and The movies changed. They were more yes. brutal. Uh, everybody's sensibilities, especially the servicemen coming back, it was a little edgier. Film noir yes. came in, the detectives, every, everything was tougher. And, and your dad, J.D., somehow it clicked in making Roy. These were brutal fights in those films. Well, what happened was is that, uh, and I think one of the reasons that Dad got hired to do the Rogers is they wanted to bring some action into the into the Rogers pictures because yeah. it was too much of the singing cowboy, you know, and uh, and so Dad had that to offer uh, from all the serials. Uh, mm -hmm. He had the action, and he was that's where he got known for for he and J uh, Jack English. Uh, his partner in the serials. And Jack um, English would do the dialogue sequences. They used to joke with each other about who shot what when they went <laughs> to the dailies. I'm, I'm not sure, that's what my dad says, I'm not sure that they, 
that because I, I think that Jack did a lot of the dialogue stuff though. Of course, they they were known for their action in the serials, and so uh, as I mentioned earlier, when Dad came back and was uh, from the war and was teamed up with uh, with the Rogers crew. Uh, and the reason that happened, uh, I believe, is because they wanted to add some action into the Rogers pictures. Uh, rather than to just have the singing cowboy, they felt that they needed a little more entertainment value. So that's where Dad came in, and, uh, uh, and his love of horses and uh, his, uh, his, uh, his ability to, to do uh, some of the action stuff is... Uh, what uh, and the Rogers loved it too. I mean, you know, yeah. that, it really changed yeah. Dad's films. The level of action was a violence, and then suddenly uh, there's there's blood that you see in the fights. They were just really aggressive, brutal fights. I, it was what he learned in the serials of how to throw a punch and people going down. Well, and I think across the board with all the studios after the war, I think they all became more violent because so many of the directors worked with the armed services mm -hmm. and they were over filming the war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when they came back, they would look at some of those soft fights and all and say, oh, that's not real, <laughs> you know? And it was rather than just putting violence for violence sake in, it was just putting reality mm -hmm. yeah. into the scenes more. Um, Dad, you know, I, before he was always shooting the gun out of people's hands, but they never got hurt. Take it easy. We'll go along to jail peaceably as soon as we get enough water. I said take it easy. And that's not really reality. Not that he couldn't do that. He was an incredible marksman, but he was also a great athlete. So with Billy bringing in the more action and stuff like that. I mean, Dad got to show off his athletic ability, and he loved it. Uh, he was a great show-off, bless his heart. He used to bet people that he could walk two blocks on his hands and doing he, a handstand, and he won every time, I swear. And he would do that down at, at Santa Monica, down at Muscle Beach. But... He had the ability to do that, which some of the Western actors didn't have that, you know, athletic ability. He Dad's, was really good at stepping up into yes, the he stirrup. Yes, he was. Oh. He was great at that. Mm -hmm. And where in the movies a lot of time he couldn't do that because the insurance companies would go insane, when he would go out and do rodeos, he'd do all of those quick mounts and all of that stuff. He really, I mean, he was so athletic and he loved to show off. Something I'm curious about is what is it about your films that have made Quentin Tarantino such a big fan of your dad's? Well, I think it was the action. I really think it was the, it was the action. And, uh, of course, Quentin has taken it a step further, <laughs> as we all know. Yes. But, you know, uh, I know that Quentin had studied yeah. my father. Uh, it, it, through uh, some of the past film festivals that he's done. Um, so he saw something there, as a lot of other directors did, to do, to do the things. Yeah. But Dad studied other directors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it came from one director to another. I know that the uh, uh, Dad used to complain that he could only go so far with some of the action. Uh, they, wouldn't let him, they wouldn't let him do the really what he wanted to do. Peck and Paw came along and he goes, Peck and Paw can do it, how come I can't do it? Yeah. You know. So there was a little bit of, you know, Peck and Paw kind of started the, what now I think we consider uh, Quentin's uh, yes. quest for... Uh, <laughs> for uh, slow motion but, blood. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, the thing yeah. is, is that when we used to play cowboys and Indians and shoot each other and stuff, it wasn't the violence that you see on TV today, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. um, it was in, it was in fun, and I think all of our all of the, all of us kids knew that it was all in fun too. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. shooting the gun out of the hand yeah. and, and 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 so on and I so mean, forth. even though we had cap guns, we knew the difference. Oh yes, so, yes we did. Yeah, I mean, we were raised to think differently, but then after the war, and then of course 
Korea and then Vietnam, they all followed close to each other. Mm -hmm. And the news became so violent. And I think the TV news had a big effect on what we started to see at the theater. Mm -hmm. These stories have been fabulous. And I, I just love the combination of the William Whitney directed Roy Rogers films. They are special. And I think they're still as popular today. And they keep the Western genre and the B-Westerns especially yeah. in everybody's hearts. Thank you for being here. Thank oh, you. thank you. becomes directly responsible for the health of an entire community. And proud indeed is the doctor who brings about such a change. Something like that happened to the frontier doctor when he stopped off to visit an old friend of his college days. Rex Allen stars as the frontier doctor. back to Rising Springs from a medical convention in Kansas City when I decided to stop off at an oil town named Richville to see an old friend. The old friend was a former patient of mine, a lawyer named Harry Clark who had come west to make a name for himself and had surprised all of us by doing just that. I found out where Harry Clark's office was and headed in that direction. I'm sorry, sir, but are you new in town? Well, yes, I just came in on the stagecoach. Oh, then of course you wouldn't know. Mr. Clark is... He's passed away. He's passed away? Last week, sir, it was quite sudden. Sudden? What was wrong with him? Some kind of infection. Perry, Perry something or other. Peritonitis? That could be, sir. I, I only know it was such a shame. And in the prime of life with so much depending on him. So much depending on him? Yes, he was defending the poor homesteaders. They were being dispossessed and driven from their land by the oil companies. Young Mr. Hamilton, his junior partner, has taken over the case. Mr. Hamilton isn't in right now. He's in court. Could I tell him you called? No, don't bother him. I, he wouldn't know me anyway. I'd better be on my way. Bye. Good day, sir. The unexpected news of Harry Clark's death unnerved me. It's like that when someone your own age dies. It's almost as if you had died a little yourself. I turned into the nearest lunchroom to collect myself over a cup of coffee. What'll it be? Cup of coffee, please. Why so glum, stranger? I just got some bad news. A friend of mine passed away. Oh, sorry. Friend of yours happened to be Harry Clark, mister? Yes. Did you know him? Yep. Friend of mine, too. 
Friend of lots of folks around here. And don't you think that them that controls the big oil money didn't know about it, too? They made sure that Harry wouldn't stay healthy. Easy, Pop. Don't go stirring up that kind of talk around here. Well, it's about time somebody had gumption enough to speak out what's on the town's mind. Just drink your coffee and pretend he ain't here. Oh, I don't mind. It's good to know Harry was well-liked. James Caldwell Peabody is the name, sir. Be mind. Sit down. <laughs> Thought I owned some land around here once till the oil syndicate and their gun hawks chased me off in it. Nothing but a janitor now, but it's honest living. I'm Dr. Bill Baxter from Rising Springs. Doctor, eh? Medical doctor? Yes, sir. Uh, would you be come to town to look into the manner of Harry Clark's passion now, would you, Doc? Pop, I'm warning you to take that talk outside. You start a fight in here most every day. Oh, go on, warm yourself. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Uh, do you know anything about the big uh, property fight that's waging in this here town, Doc? The people versus the syndicate that's gobbling up all the oil land? You know anything about that? No, I hadn't heard about it. Well, there's a lot of folks in this town who's got a strong hunch that Harry Clark was murdered by the syndicate. Pop! You don't pay attention to him, mister. He's just an old busybody. Everybody knows about his tall tales. Tall tales, eh? Yes. Yeah. You wait till I get on that witness stand tomorrow. I'll tell this town a thing or two. You betcha, betcha, betcha. You betcha, betcha, betcha. Hmm. Are you sure that you didn't come to this town to investigate the reason for Clark's sudden death? Hmm? Look, I've got to get out of here. My stagecoach is overdue. Hey, there's one of that darn oil crowd right now. I thought we taught you to keep your mouth shut. took a hand, eh, son? <laughs> as long as you're going to be around here a couple of days, I reckon we better pick up your gear and find you a hotel room. First class hotel right around the corner. paper in the wastebasket of the county clerk's office. Not just scraps of paper, Doc, but ten money wrappers. You know, them bands made out of paper that comes wrapped around money when it comes in bundles? And each one had a thousand dollars marked on it. I also found a manila envelope that had registered mail marked on it. So you took all these wrappings over to Mr. Clark. You figure they killed him for that? Why not? We got a new county clerk in this here county. Slocum's his name. Never did trust him. I can smell a bribe a mile away. Why, he could do away with the record book of our property deeds and we'd all be sunk. But your own coroner testified the cause of death. Acute peritonitis. I don't mean the same. Coroner and the county clerk are the same man in this county. Why, Slocum had the power to have a man like Clark murdered, cover over a wrong deed, and as coroner, he could say that he died of almost anything now, couldn't he? Wouldn't be that easy, Pop. There'd be a doctor's report at the time of death. Well, there weren't no doctor present at the time of death, like I told you. Uh, Clark dropped dead right outside of his office. And the coroner's jury just took Slocum's word for it. Slocum? Slocum, yeah, that's the county clerk coroner I was telling you about. He performed the autopsy. Why would he want to falsify a death certificate? For money, what else? What else would a feller falsify and steal and commit murder for her? Very serious accusing, Pop. I couldn't just take your word for it. We don't have to. Just ask anybody in this town. Why don't we forget it, huh? It's none of my business anyway. I reckon I'm mistooken in you, Dr. Baxter. From the way you talked, I thought you was a friend to Harry Clark's. Oh, hello, 
sir. Mr. Hamilton is in now, but he has someone with him. If you would care to wait. Oh, yes, I'd... Oh, Mr. Hamilton. This is a friend of Mr. Clark's I was telling you about. Mr. Baxter. Dr. Bill Baxter. Uh, how do you do, Doctor? Miss Wilson said you've been here. Come on in. I'm just between appointments. Thank you. Have a seat, Doctor. Thank you. Well, the trial goes into its last day tomorrow. It's a lot of coming and going to try to save the sinking ship. As bad as that? No use trying to kid myself. I've always had a good healthy respect for Harry Clark's judgment. I don't think he would take on a junior partner who wasn't just as honest as he was. I'm not sure I know just how to take that remark, Doctor. You'd have more to gain by winning this case than losing it, right? Certainly. If Harry took the case, I think he felt the cause was just and that he had a good chance of winning it. Right again? That happens to be the way I feel myself. And why are you losing it? Look here, I resent this kind of prying, sir. Do you think Harry Clark was murdered? That's a big question, Doctor. What I hear the stakes are, too. Just what are they? Very simple. The people who homesteaded the land got their deeds when this territory became a state. The cattle barons who own the oil syndicate claim the mineral and oil rights under a federal grant before the homesteaders moved in. And the original land grant carries more weight. Is that about it? That's about it. The moral right is on the side of the homesteaders, but their legal right to the land is up to the judge. The law is the law. I talked to an old fellow named Peabody. He's a janitor over at the courthouse. Old Pop? Everybody knows about him. He's considered a crank. Told me he was going to testify. I'm putting him on the stand tomorrow, but I don't expect anybody to believe the town storyteller. Any port in the storm, though? These money wrappers that Pop found and took over to Mr. Clark, do you consider them a motive for murder? I do. But so far, those wrappers have never been found among Harry's briefs or effects. You ever think of checking that autopsy or running another? That wouldn't be easy to arrange, Doctor. But if you could prove it had some bearing on the case, maybe... I'm sorry. I have only your suspicion and that of a, an eccentric old man. I suppose you're right. Well... Nice to meet you. Goodbye, Doctor. and the reference the waitress made to Miss Wilson, I made it a point to visit the coroner's office. Well, what can I do for you, sir? Your name's Logan? Yes, sir. I'm Dr. Bill Baxter, Rising Springs. Pardon me. I'll see you later. Oh, good day. I'm sorry, doctor. I'm very busy at the moment. I know. Do you mind if I assist with the autopsy? You? What for? Pop was a friend of mine. Sorry, Doctor. Highly irregular. Read my reports later. Good day, sir. You're sure Pop died of strychnine poisoning? I didn't say I was sure. Only an autopsy could prove that. But he had all the symptoms. Titanic convulsions, respiratory failure. All right. Granted, he was poisoned. There's still the question, who and how? The waitress in the cafe placed your secretary as the last person with him. She could have slipped the poison in his coffee. 
But think what that means. She was here before I came. Harry's secretary. He brought her from the East? Uh, no. He hired her here. All these briefs you've been using in this case, they go over her desk, don't they? Naturally. She must have had Harry's full confidence. Up till right now, she's had mine. Well, she's not here. I can't believe it. There's only one way to make certain. That's an autopsy on Pop. You uh, don't believe the coroner's report of heart failure, huh? Do you? Then why don't you give me a chance to do an autopsy? All right. You'll have it. You'll have it if I have to... Never mind, just stick tight to your hotel room till you hear from me. I have a feeling I've been followed ever since I hit town. Let's get out of here. Keep low. It was almost midnight when Hamilton called for me, telling me everything was ready. From the way Hamilton acted, I knew that although he had a key to the coroner's office, he did not have official permission for the autopsy. But since he didn't volunteer an explanation, I knew better than to ask. This was no time to let legal red tape stand in the way of establishing a possible clue of murder. The laboratory's in here, Doc. I suggest you pull the outside shades down before you start to work. Just one thing, did you question Ms. Wilson? I thought we'd better wait for the results of the autopsy. I'm keeping a working mate, though, typing material for tomorrow's session in court. She won't close the office till I get back. I'll be as quick as I can. What I had to do wasn't pleasant, but it had to be done. And the laboratory was well equipped for the job the coroner should have done in the first place. Well, Doc? Strict nine. No. Hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it sure is. It's something you don't want to believe. light on in there now. Oh, I tell you, I saw one. Go on, Doc. You're the key to the case. Out the back way. Go on, beat it. Go on, Doc. Halt! In the name of the law! Go on, to the other I knew what Hamilton meant. I was the key to his case, and now he was giving me this chance to get away. I beg your pardon, Doctor. I mean, anyone who could poison an old man. Cold-bloodedly drop a pellet of strychnine in an old man's coffee. You wouldn't think a person like that would frighten very easily, would you, Miss Wilson? I don't. Really, sir. I haven't the least idea what you're talking about. Is that how you poisoned Harry Clark? Did you put it in his coffee, too? I understand he was found just outside on the street. Did he just have time to stagger out of here, trying to get help, gasping for breath? While well, you stood right about where you are now and watched him, Miss Wilson, is that how it was? You get out of here. You get out of here right now or I'll... <clears throat> Go ahead and scream for the constable. In fact, I'll help you. Better yet, why don't both of us go over and see him, together? recognized one of the men as the coroner Slocum. The other was the man who had been watching me since I'd hit town. The man who was in the coroner's office earlier in the day. Hi, it's me. We'll put him down in here. Turn around. I knew it was now or never. Let the fire 
take care of it. Let's go. cellar all right. I thought I'd be safe from the fire underground. I was wrong. It was a storeroom for the explosives used in the oil fields. my problems they were only too willing to help it was after daybreak before I got back to town doc where have you been I've had people looking all over for you where have you been I just got out on bail Slocum tried to kill me he left me out in that oil fire to burn doc I'm sure glad you're alive we've got the oil syndicate and Slocum dead to rights and the charge of conspiracy and murder and you're gonna help me prove it just a minute I've been looking for you, stranger. You're wanted for breaking an entry along with him last night. Now, he'll probably get you out on bail, but at least I've done my duty. Forget it, Constable. We've got a case to win. Now, don't try that fast lawyer talk on me, Hamilton. This stranger goes to jail, and you can both do your talking in court. Well, you took the law into your hands last night. I guess it's my turn now. We're temporarily without law and order. We'd better go see Slocum herself before he gets any ideas about leaving town after he sees me. All right, Doc, let's go. It's all over with us, don't you understand? Hamilton knows the old man was poisoned. Oh, knowing something's one thing, but proving it is something else. Doc Baxter's dead. Without him, Hamilton's all washed up. For lack of evidence, they'll laugh that two-bit lawyer right out of town. You're a fool. There are other lawyers. The 10,000 we got, that's just chicken feed. When the court decides in our favor, we get another 50,000. Please. Calm yourself, Let's Jane. get out of here Calm now. Yourself. Please. Oh. Ah. Let's go. All right, all right. Get over there. I was expecting you, Constable. Here's the man you're after. You might want to question her, too. I won't take the blame for it alone. I won't. 
He's as guilty as I am. I'll tell you everything you want to know. Everything you hear. I'm guilty. Sure, I'm guilty. But he is too. <laughs> Well, I sure wish I knew what was going on around here. Suppose you take us all over to the judge's chambers, Constable. Then you'll get everything straight. That's a good idea. Here you are, Constable. Thanks, stranger. Will you trust us to follow you in a few minutes? We've got to pass the word to the squatters to fight that fire. From now on, it'll be their own property they'll be saving. You bet I will. Let's go, Doc. All right, come on. You two, come on. Miss Wilson's confession uncovered the oil company's conspiracy and the judge canceled their land grant. The settlers regained possession of their property and became richer than their fondest dreams. Miss Wilson and Slocum were quickly indicted by the court for the murders of Pop and Harry Clark. Richville was lavish with their praises. Their thanks made me feel guilty. For I couldn't help feel old Pop Peabody and Harry Clark, wherever they might be, had a hand in the fighting and winning of the case for the settlers.